2020 has been a challenging year for everyone in our community throughout the coronavirus pandemic. We've all had to adapt and pivot from the way we function to the way we communicate. But there are still very important decisions being made by our city government about the response to the pandemic and so much more. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for elected officials in our community to connect directly with you and for you to hear from them. Welcome to Ward Updates, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with Ottawa City Councillors. We'll talk about the issues arising from this crisis that directly affect you, your neighbours, your families. We will share stories of people who have been rising to the occasion throughout the community, the heroes of the pandemic crisis. And we'll talk about other important issues at Ottawa City Hall. My guest today is the City Councillor for Ward 2, Innis Ward, Laura Dudas. Laura, welcome. Thank you for having me here, Mark. Tell me a little bit about how you've been adapting and how you and your team and your family and everyone around you has adjusted during this time. Well, it's, you know, easily one of my favorite parts of being a counselor ever since my election in 2018 has been getting into the community, getting to meet people and getting to, to address their needs directly. Needless to say, because of the pandemic, all of that has had to change. Both myself and many of the community organizations and associations in the ward have had to find new ways to adapt and reach out to people and quite literally turn to online as a source of that connection. Um, it's been very difficult for, for myself and for other associations and groups to do that. So in the last maybe couple of months, we've been really hitting our stride. We've been finding new ways to connect with people. I myself have been able to uh, hold numerous online pop-up hours, which have been very well attended. And I've noticed that a lot of people who I've never had a chance to meet before out in the community at some of the regular public consultations are now taking this opportunity to use these virtual formats to connect with myself and, and the city and to be involved in city consultations. And I found it very interesting that you mentioned about the heroes and the positive stories that have arisen from this pandemic. You know, the pandemic has been a, a very, it's a bit of our strength as a community, as a city, and it's been the greatest disruption to our society since the end of the war. But throughout the pandemic, as you noted, there have been heroes. And last June, recognizing that we needed to have positive and, and uh, uplifting stories brought to people's attention, I launched an award called Heroes of Innis, where we had the opportunity to recognize people in the community who were nominated by their fellow colleagues, family members, citizens, who had gone above and beyond and had truly made a difference in the lives of those around them. So it was such an incredible experience. It was humbling for me to see how many volunteers were you know, rising above the fray and, and making a difference. And I look forward to, to holding a similar type of event of that sort in the years to come. Can you tell me a little bit about some of those uh, heroes, some of the examples of uh, amazing behavior that you've seen in your community? What have you witnessed? I'd be absolutely honored to do so. We, we had the opportunity to recognize a, a young woman who had just only graduated in 2019 from, from nursing school. She was one of the first people to volunteer at the uh, COVID assessment center at Brewer Park. She uh, had to isolate herself from her family during her volunteer work at the assessment center and while she worked at the Ottawa hospital because of the, the uh, risk that it posed of her work. But yet she she went above me on. She did something that um, you know some of us can't even fathom. Uh, there was another uh, a couple in our community who held a plant sale so that they could raise mon money for our food banks and and you know bring attention to the fact that some of our most vulnerable pe people in our community needed support during this pandemic. And those are just two of the stories. We recognized so many people throughout the entire uh, segment. We had a whole five awards given and you know the stories keep coming about these positive experiences. What do you think some of the lessons are arising from this pandemic? How will things function differently in the future? How do we as a community need to adapt? Well, 
you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've had, I personally have had to change the way that I'm communicating with residents, We're having to find different ways using online formats to engage people and make them feel safe in their communications with myself and with city consultations. And it was interesting because recently during the World uh, Urban Boundary Review and the conversations at a city committee, we saw more than 100 delegations come out and provide their comments. This is something that's almost never uh, heard of. And a lot of these residents are saying that this is a unique opportunity in their busy lives to take time to be engaged with their city. So this feedback was amazingly great to hear. Um, and it led me to tabling a direction to city staff to look into how the city can permanently add online engagement tools into their repertoire of engaging community members and public consultations going forward. And one of the other things that we've found is, is that there's been an increased level of collaboration amongst all levels of government. So in the East End, for instance, interesting enough, as a result of the pandemic, we've been holding weekly intergovernmental meetings involving our MP, Stephen Blay, Mary France Lalonde, who is our federal representative, and Councillor uh, Matt Lula for Orleans Ward. And what this has allowed us is to, to collaborate, to be more effective in our representation of Orleans residents. And the, the other aspect that's come out of that is we're now holding consultations with the community hosted by community associations, which I, I believe may be the first time in the East End where we've had three levels of government on the same virtual meeting where residents can just ask questions and provide their feedback. And then we can work together to find solutions and, and get action for the East End. Now, speaking of action for the East End, uh, I know that for you and for other city councillors, economic development in the East End been a priority. Uh, how do you think the pandemic is affecting that? We had talked in the past about trying to create more jobs in the East End uh, to, to stimulate the economy there. That's been an issue for a long time. Uh, how does that issue change as a result of what's happened now? Well, it's, you bring up a very good point. Um, you know, many residents of the East End traditionally have had to travel outside of the community to work. Nearly 80% of Orleans residents leave the community for work, either they're heading downtown, to Gatineau, or the South End. And this has been a historical issue that all of my East End colleagues and all levels of government have had to, to grapple with. Obviously, uh, the city is limited in its ability to direct the federal government to bring jobs to the east. So we've had to think of alternative ways to attract new businesses. One of the major initiatives, uh, initiatives that's been worked on in the last you know, year and a half, and we're going to start seeing come to fruition in the year to come, is the Orleans Community Development Plan, or the CIP. This CIP provides financial incentives to attract major knowledge-based employers. We're, we're talking about clean technology, uh, photonics, sciences. We're attracting these businesses to the East End to encourage the creation of jobs. Additionally, the CIP would also encourage property owners to invest in the lands and the buildings that are currently being underutilized and to really try to spring life and revitalize some of these spaces in our community that need this extra attention. What does that look like in the long run? Do you think there is the opportunity arising out of this uh, to stimulate more growth in the East End? And even something as simple as more people working from home in the future, is that going to create a kind of economic development? Most certainly, the pandemic has changed the way we've all thought in regards to how we work. As you mentioned, you know, we're seeing a lot of the public service staying at home, working, and we're anticipating people slowly working their way back to getting into their, their jobs. And maybe some will never return back to the office. For the East End, that is an opportunity. That's an opportunity to have more people continue to work in, in their homes, in their spaces. Uh, for instance, at Plast Orleans, the federal government has a, a, a shared community hub where their employers can go work there. But the other interesting part is that will also generate money for the local economy and our local businesses. What we've seen traditionally is our local small business owners are not seeing business driven throughout the day. They're seeing it in the after hours and on weekends. But with having more people working from home, this is once again an opportunity to, to keep more money in the local economy at the micro level. 
But I'd also like to point out that one of the, the big major drivers of the work that we're going to see and the benefits, the economic development benefits we're going to see is the LRT. You know, the existing LRT currently stops at Blair and we're going to see with stage two that it extends all the way to Trim Line. That's going to add five new stations to the East End alone. And that work is supposed to be done in 2024, 2025. So what's been happening is as part of the new official plan, as well as the Orleans Corridor secondary plan, we're using this as an opportunity to look at the lands adjacent to LRT stations to properly zone them so that we can incentivize and attract not only businesses, but also mixed use residential, new commercial, and really, really, really revitalize areas like St. Joseph, which is the heart of the East End, and try to try to keep the economy you know, strong that exists here while attracting new investments. You mentioned LRT, uh, obviously phase two is underway. That's gonna have a big impact on the East End, uh, but at the same time, fewer people are using public transit right now because of the pandemic. And there is a risk that going forward, uh, it won't return to previous levels because there will be some hesitation about using public transit uh, because of, you're going to be around other people, the risk of infection. Uh, so what do you think about that? What's your assessment of the future of public transit in the context of all we've learned during this pandemic? Public transit is, is certainly something that is a part of the city's transportation network. You know, multiple people over the course of the last several months, as we've been seeing, have been turning to alternative forms of transportation. They've been hopping on their bikes. They've been walking to get to places. Um, you know, some of them have been opting to drive. But we're seeing more people moving in and around their own neighborhoods and staying in their communities. And investing in active transportation is something that, you know, the city most certainly is, is looking to accelerate in anticipation of that continued need. So for instance, in uh, last June it was, I worked very closely with several of my council colleagues and the mayor to draft a letter to the federal government encouraging them to help us as a city accelerate transportation projects. So these are projects such as uh, cycling corridors. I'm currently working on the Orleans Boulevard cycling corridor, which would see a, a cycling connection from the end of Orleans, the top of Orleans, all the way down to the river, connecting to LRT, but also connecting to local businesses. So investing in multiple forms of transportation, whether it's building the roads that we absolutely need, investing in our public transit system and making sure we're bringing that back to where it needs to be, and also investing in our cycling infrastructure and multi-use pathways to keep pedestrians and cyclists in, as engaged in active transportation as, as we can. Do you worry about the future of light rail though, given what a, a struggle it's been the first year, how many issues there have been, the loss of public confidence uh, and, and all of the other problems that have resulted from this. When you add that to the fact that people have now formed new habits uh, and might be reluctant to use public transit going forward, is that gonna create an enduring problem for, for the city? So Mark, I, I use public transit uh, prior to COVID. I would be taking it in to get to, to City Hall when I didn't, wasn't working in the community. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to sugarcoat it. It hasn't been exp the experience that we anticipated. <laughs> I think I may have just sugarcoated it there. It's been a disappointment in terms mm -hmm. of the first stage. But, you know, we're starting to see that the improvements are being made. Um, the RTM, which has been operating it, has changed their management. We've been getting some uh, good feedback about those changes, and we're starting to see improvements. You know, it's, it's not great as it is, but in terms of communities like the east end of our city, the west end, and even the south end, a lot of the real benefits that we're going to see with LRT comes in stage two. Those, those communities, such as mine, are going to see additional stations. We're going to see connectivity to not just the, the train, but our bus systems will be able to be improved and shortened so people have shorter commutes to and from stations. So the real benefits of the system was never in the, in the you know, stage one, not for communities like mine. It's in the second stage. It's in the stage where it's in our community, it's in our neighborhood, and we have the service and the convenience that we require. So, you know, I'm certainly optimistic that it will be getting to the place we need it to be 
by the time we need it. And, you know, the, the fact is, while I've said it's been, it was a disappointment to start and we're continuing to, to, you know, press the company to deliver on the product that we expect and we will continue to do that. The benefit to our community in the long run, to the environment, to our residents, to our transportation network is significant. What impact is that going to have on development in Innis Ward? Uh, just give us a picture of how the area is going to evolve around the transit infrastructure that's being built. Well, certainly smart development is a, is a very high priority for the city as a whole as part of the official plan, but the East End in particular. So when we're talking about the LRT and how that's going to shape what we see as the East End, we're going to start seeing more intensification around LRT, the corridor. As I mentioned before, the Orleans corridor secondary plan will really try to attract jobs, but it's also going to attract mixed use, residential, affordable housing along the LRT corridor so that people have the amenities and the transportation that they need right outside their doors within a very close proximity to where they live. And that's really essential. You, you spoke before about getting more people on the train. Well, having a train very close to your home within walking distance or a short bike ride is something that will attract people to that convenience. So we're going to see in the East End taller buildings. We're going to see more uh, density around LRT and in the areas in close proximity. This will allow us to not grow our urban boundary. This will allow us to be more environmentally sensitive. And it will also allow us to really focus our infrastructure dollars on those areas. The, the one of the problems that we've seen historically in the East End is we haven't had infrastructure keep pace with the rate of our growth. We've been seeing communities that are being built on the premise that infrastructure was going to be built in lockstep, whether it's infrastructure, even, even amenities like commercial spaces or schools. And that just hasn't been happening. You know, I have, a, I have a wonderful community in the south end of my ward called Bradley Estates. The houses are amazing. The green space is, is absolutely phenomenal. But this community, which is over a decade old, it, it's almost 20 years old now, it doesn't have schools close by. It's only started to see that. It doesn't have roads that accommodate the growth. We're talking about, you know, rural country roads that are still taking on the traffic. So we need to start investing in infrastructure in these communities at the same time that these communities are being built. During the, the recent uh, urban boundary review and the conversations about the official plan, I tabled a motion that was passed that really enshrined into the official plan that as these communities are being built and as infill is coming into existing communities, the infrastructure is to keep pace. So what will happen now is, is that as developers are uh, planning and working through the development process, they have to be upfront and accountable to their new home buyers and to the community around them about real timelines as to when infrastructure such as roads, sidewalks, transit, schools, are going to be instituted. And that way it's a, it's a clear process, it's a fair process, and it really gives new home buyers and the existing community at around a chance to understand what is coming in and how it's going to change their area. Let's talk about traffic and community safety. Uh, there's been a renewed emphasis on making sure that it's uh, it's it's possible for pedestrians, cyclists, uh, people on scooters, people on other modes of transportation, and vehicles all have uh, the opportunity to travel the road safely and the sidewalks as well. Um, can you give us an update on what's happening there? And and do you think some of the initiatives like this pilot project around photo radar in school zones uh, should be extended in the long run? The Innis Ward residents, um, as you mentioned, are, are probably like every community across the city. They're consistently identifying that traffic and road safety is one of their greatest concerns. And this is one of the issues that I'm actually very happy to look back at the last two years of my, of my role as, as a counselor for this area to see how many improvements we've actually been able to bring forward as a city for these communities. We've seen new traffic calming measures installed in Chapel Hill North, uh, Chateauneuf, 
in Bradley Estates, Blackburn Hamlet, and the Shadow Nook neighborhoods. I mentioned Shadow Nook already. Uh, this, this work has included everything from flex stakes to uh, painted lines, thermoplast, seals on the road, identifying school zones, speed boards, and even sp painted speed limits. And throughout the ward in two locations, actually, in Shadow Nook and uh, Chapel Hill South, we've been testing out what um, I consider a very exciting new traffic control pro program. It's the gateway speed, uh, gateway signage. So what it is, is it, it designates an area of a residential community as 40 kilometers. And what it does is it lowers the speed limits in these residential areas. It indicates to drivers as they're coming into the area that this is a residential zone and to take extra care. And it makes it safer for all road users and the families and communities that live within these areas. I've been very relieved to see that these, these uh, different initiatives have received a lot of positive feedback and has helped slow down a lot of the traffic issues that we've been seeing in our community. While we're on the subject of community safety, let's talk a little bit about uh, the future of policing in Ottawa. I'm interested to hear your opinion about the debate that's been happening throughout North America about the role of police, some of the systemic issues uh, that, uh, that are uh, being confronted right now, systemic racism in many of our institutions. Um, what do you think needs to be done to address that in Ottawa? And how do you feel about the concept of uh, defunding the police or at least streaming some of the funding away from law enforcement towards mental health services and other social services to address some of the problems that the police have been uh, compelled to take on because there aren't other solutions. This, um, this is a very pertinent issue. Actually, it's been an issue for, for many, well, forever. Um, you know, people in our community need to feel safe and you know we've seen since I, I believe it was in May with the the death the horrific death of Mr. Floyd down in, in the United States that there has been nude attention uh, from an involvement and engagement from all members of our community to really bring an end and eradicate racism in terms of you know, our city and what we're doing, we hired uh, Chief Peter Slowly as the Ottawa Police Chief. He's come in with a mandate to really take on these issues as well as to, to you know, work as a chief, but he's brought in his own perspective of how he is going to start addressing its systemic racism and to make sure that there's a fairness and equality to how people are being treated in their interactions with police. As a, as a black man himself, he brings a unique perspective that we haven't had in our police force in the past. And, you know, I'm very much looking forward to what he can achieve going forward in terms of really, you know, ending this rift with the community. I recently held a, a phenomenal panel with strong Black women in in uh, Innis Ward and in the area, and you know, hearing the words that they have to say, the experiences that they've had throughout their lives, not necessarily always with the police, but with people and society, you know, this is something that we need to address head on. It's something that we as a city need to take tackle and and be upfront about. And you know, I was very very proud and honored to see that Councillor Rawson King was elected in 2019, being the first Black councillor to City Council. This is something that is groundbreaking, and I'm very much excited and eager to work with him to start addressing some of these issues going forward. What's happened over the last six months has obviously had a huge impact on the city finances. You're about to go into some budget deliberations over the next couple of months to talk about 2021. What are your feelings about how difficult it's going to be to, to bridge some of the gaps that have been created in the budget? I know you're getting some provincial and federal funding, but that won't cover everything. Do we need to cut in some areas? Do taxes need to go up? What do you think about that? 
So I was very pleased to see that the province and the federal government will be contributing $124 million towards the city, which would be divided amongst the, I believe 75 million is going towards transit with the remainder going towards maintaining essential city operations. This is good news. Um, you know, we cannot, we cannot incur debt as a municipality. It's something we're not allowed to do under provincial uh, mandated legislation. So to have that money uh, and that ability to basically fill the gaps, that's something that we needed to hear. Now, unfortunately, that does not make our city whole. Our in the debt that we're looking at seeing by the end of this year will be $192 million. Our city staff are working incredibly hard to fill in the gap, to make sure that we can make it to the end of the year. They are confident that we will see continued support from our provincial and federal partners, as well as I. I'm very, I'm very uh, confident that we will see additional funds that come to the city in terms of trying to make us whole. And you know, the the unfortunate, the awful part about this pandemic is, is that you know, the city and our residents have also felt financial pain. Many people have lost their jobs, have been temporarily laid off, are under financial strain themselves. So passing on the costs, the debt that the city has incurred during the pandemic to our taxpayers is the last thing we want to do. We want to make sure that they're sheltered from this, that we're trying to find alternative ways to make sure that we're still continuing as a city to provide all the essential services that a city needs to do to keep our community healthy, safe, operating, and you know prosperous for many years to come. All right, in our final 30 seconds or so, we're short on time, but is there any message that you want to leave with the residents of Innis Ward uh, as we continue to manage our way through this pandemic crisis? You know, I want to thank the community. Uh, they've been absolutely phenomenal. As I saw with that award program, the Heroes of Innis, and as I'm seeing every single day through the businesses that are, are you know, restarting, the ones that are opening, you know, there's so many people that are working so hard to get our city back on its feet after this pandemic. We still have a ways to go. It's not done. We need to we need to see a vaccine and we need to continue to abide by the words of Ottawa Public Health in terms of wearing masks and staying a distance from people and keeping each other healthy. But in terms of Innis Ward, I'm incredibly honored and, and proud to serve this community. You know, they've been absolutely strong. They give me strength. And I, I look forward to continuing to work with members of our community, our business community, our organizations to fully recover right. from this pandemic to come out even stronger. Laura Dudas, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Mark. And that concludes our update from Innis Ward, Ward 2. Thank you for watching.